University of Mary with a degree in accounting and holds his CPA. Welcome, James. Thank you, Kelly. Imagine this. It's the day of your organization's financial statement audit and the auditors are on their way. You feel the tension in the air as everyone prepares for the scrutiny that lies ahead. But what if I told you that preparing for an audit doesn't have to be a nerve wracking experience? What if I showed you how to transform it into an opportunity for growth and confidence in your financial processes? Today, we're here to unveil the secrets of successful audit preparation that will not only ensure compliance, but also empower your organization to thrive. Are you ready to unlock the power of preparation? Throughout the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will cover five major topics while hopefully splashing in a few other important pieces. I will first walk through understanding the importance of an audit and the misconceptions of an audit. We'll get to the meat of the presentation when we look at the steps to prepare for an audit some common audit findings, and finally, the financial records to be requested. We start with the importance of an audit. The importance of an audit cannot be overstated, it is, as it serves a crucial purpose for organizations and stakeholders. We look at the accuracy and reliability. Audits prefer, provide assurance and accuracy on the reliability of the organization's financial statements by examining the records, transactions, in supporting documentations. Auditors verify that the information is presented from free from material misstatement or manipulation. Next, we have transparency and accountability. Audits promote transparency by providing an independent assessment of an organization's financial position, performance, and cash flows. The audit process ens ensures the financial information is disclosed in accordance with standards and regulatory requirements, en enabling stakeholders to make informed decisions. We at the auditor's office believe that transparency is crucial to taxpayers. When government agencies and institutions with, operate with transparency, taxpayers can see how their dollars are being utilized and ensure that public resources are being managed responsibly. Transparency allows taxpayers to hold governments accountable for their actions, promotes fair and equitable dis distribution of funds, and enables individuals to make well-informed judgments about public policies and the performance of public officials. Ultimately, transparency strengthens the relationship between taxpayers and the government, ensuring the taxpayer funds that are used efficiently and effectively to serve the best interests interest of the community. We next have detecting and preventing fraud. Audits play a role in detecting and preventing fraudulent activities within an organization. Through their examination and testing procedures, auditors assess the effectiveness, effectiveness of internal controls and identify any signs or of irregularities and fraudulent activities. This helps safeguard assets, mitigate risks, and maintain the integrity of financial information. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners 2020 report to the nations, organizations most commonly find fraud through tips at 43% of the time, followed by internal audits 15% of the time, management review, 14% of the time, whistleblowing, 6% of the time, and external audits at 4% of the time. As you can see, audits can play a role, but are not specifically designed to detect, to, to detect or prevent fraud. We have compliance with laws and regulations. Audits help organizations demonstrate their compliance with applicable laws, regulations, and industry-specific standards. By examining financial records and internal control systems, auditors verify that the organization has adhered to the required guidelines and statutory requirements, reducing the risk of legal and regulatory noncompliance. And lastly, financial statement audits build trust. A well-conducted audit instills trust and confidence in most stakeholders, including customers, suppliers, and the public. The independent nature of audit processes lends credibility to an organization's financial statements and reassures stakeholders that the organization is committed to financial integrity and transparency. In summary, audits are essential for ensuring the accuracy of financial information, and the audit plays a 
vital role in maintaining the integrity of financial reporting and enhancing the overall govern governance of operations. We will now go through some misconceptions of an audit. First, we have audits are only conducted to find errors or wrongdoing. As mentioned previously, audits are conducted for many different beneficial reasons, and they're not solely focused on uncovering mistakes or detecting fraud. At times, mistakes or fraud come to light, but that is a byproduct of going through the audit process. Next, we have only organizations with issues or problems get audited. In general, audits are standard practice for many organizations, regardless of size. For political subdivisions of the state of North Dakota, North Dakota Century Code 5410 governs who must receive an audit required by the legislature. Dan Cox will discuss the changes from the 68th legislative session later today, but our office has worked very hard over the last two sessions to update the audit requirements to more closely match where taxpayer money is being spent. The next one is auditors are out to catch organizations in non-compliance. Some individuals may believe that the auditors have an adversarial role and are looking for opportunities to find fault. However, auditors aim to provide an objective assessment on an organization's financial statements and internal controls. We are here to help and want to make sure that we have a great working relationship with our clients. The fourth one is preparing for an audit is a one-time event. Many people perceive an audit in audit preparation as a last minute scramble before the auditors arrive. Even I have been in this boat. However, effective audit preparation is an ongoing process that involves establishing sound financial practices, maintaining accurate records, and implementing strong internal controls throughout the year. By treating audit preparation as a continuous effort, organizations can reduce the time and enhance overall financial management. And last, we have audits are solely the responsibility of the local auditor. While the local auditor plays a vital role in audit preparation, it is essential to recognize that audits involve the entire organization. From board members to the manager of each department, everyone has a shared responsibility to collaborate and communicate to ensure a successful audit. Now let's get to the meat of the presentation in the time that we have together today. We are going to go over some main points to help you prepare for an audit, and hopefully you can take these and put, implement them throughout the year. First, we have start early. The first and most important thing we can do to prepare for an audit is to start early. I have a quote on the slide from Benjamin Frank, Franklin. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. If you think about the quote, we've all been there. If we wait until the last minute, we are more likely to fail. This generally le leads to more problems. We may forget to complete a task. We may rush to complete a task and not provide the proper information or look past a calculation mistake. If we don't start early, we are setting ourselves up to fail and improve processes and other pieces will help us down the road, but we can't do that if we don't start early. We don't always practice what we preach, but we all know that we can allocate more time to the projects that take that time and the ones that we may not like. And if we focus on these tasks early, we can avoid costly missteps. Next, we have knowing the standards. There's a long list of standards here and we're all probably tired of GASB, but I'll walk through these a little bit, but I'm not gonna go into the too much depth because we all have different accounting needs, but I want you to be aware of them. GASB is constantly releasing different standards every year to help the financial statements become more readable for users. If you need help, I'm confident the staff at the State Auditor's Office is willing to help you and please help reach out to us. Implementation of these standards can vary significantly from one political subdivision to another, so understanding your needs is critical to ensuring your financial statements are presented fairly. Again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. When you look at GASB 87 leases, it's a big change to the way we've always accounted for leases. This should have already been implemented by your, your political subdivision. GASB 91 is conduit debt obligations. The primary objectives of GASB 91 are to provide for a single method of reporting conduit debt obligations by issuers and eliminate diversity in practice associated with one, 
commitments extended by issuers, two, arrangements associated, associated with conduit debt obligations, and three, related no disclosures. This should have been implemented with fiscal years after December 15, 2021. GASB 94 is to improve, improve financial reporting by addressing issues related to public-private and public-public partnership arrangements, otherwise known as PPPs. PPPs are more unique, but you should evaluate your activities to determine if they meet the criteria. GASB 94 needs to be implemented for fiscal years after June 30th, 2022. GASB 96 is the change that will affect most groups. Sabidas are subscription-based information technology arrangements. The standard is very similar to GASB 87 leases, but for IT-based subscriptions. The rising cost of IT subscriptions and the reliance by governments on these subscriptions can create a significant li liability that has previously gone unreported. GASB 97 relates to certain or it has a multiple multitude of changes and relates to certain component unit criteria and accounting and financial reporting for Section 457 plans. If the standard reply, applies to you, you should research it further as there are many different parts. Finally, we have GASB's 100 and 101. We've broke the century mark. GASB 100, its primary objective is to enhance financial reporting requirements for accounting changes and errors. This has always been a tough topic, so hopefully GASB 100 provides some consistency going forward. It is effective for fiscal years starting after June 15, 2023. GASB 101 relates to compensated absences. The statement aims to better the information needs of financial statement users by updating the recognition and measurement guidance. The objective is achieved by aligning the recognition and measurement guidance under a unified model and by amending certain previously required disclosures. GASB 101 is effective for fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2023. As you can tell, GASB continues to put out standards. It's imperative that we continue to follow these and stay up to date on them to ensure that our financial statements are reported accurately. Next, we have strengthening internal controls. You may be wondering what this picture has to do with strengthening internal controls. Well, I have two young kids, and I can tell you they love strawberries. As you can see in the picture, the little one is helping themselves to some strawberries on the cutting board. What happens if they grab a strawberry that's not washed or cut? What happens if they grab a knife sitting on the cutting board instead of the strawberry? Our safety measures or internal controls as parents can sometimes fail as we get distracted by another child or another activity. Maybe the water started to boil over on the oven and you had to run over and grab it before it hit the floor. Whatever it may be, the young child has tried to capitalize on the opportunity of the strawberries being left unattended. Sometimes fixes are easy. Sometimes they're not, such as moving the cutting board. The, an easy fix would be moving the cutting board away from the edge. Sometimes strengthening controls is a lengthy process and another set of eyes are needed. Now my kids, they would have grabbed their stools. They'd have been over there, regardless if I moved the cutting board away from the edge or not. When we talk about strengthening the internal controls, we do so to mitigate risk, prevent fraud, and ensure financial and accurate financial reporting. You need to take a step back and analyze where weaknesses may appear in your processes and implement change to reduce the likelihood of issues taking place. A couple examples of strengthening internal controls is a segregation of duties in regular review and reconciliation. Not all of you will have sufficient staff to segregate all steps of a process, but steps can be taken to mitigate the risk of a process failing. If regular review and reconciliation take place, errors are more likely to be caught on a regular basis and transactions that seem odd in nature will draw questions sooner. These are just a few examples. Continuing to evaluate controls on a consistent basis will only improve your operations and make preparing for an audit smoother. Next, we have document, document, document. Documentation, it can't be much more clear. I'm one to over document to cover questions that will happen in the future. Now there are two types of documentation, paper and electronic. You were probably thinking, oh my, I don't have room for 10 filing cabinets. 
but electronic files are just as good. Having documentation of the transaction is imperative to validating legit, the legitimacy of the transaction. My recommendation is to scan and electronically file as much as you can. This will even be helpful in the future during field work or after when documents are requested or by the audit team. If paper documentation is needed, you should create a retention policy if you don't already have one. After each fiscal year, you should review that retention policy and the rec records that may fall under it and dispose of them properly. The next step is to review and reconcile. I mentioned an example of internal controls to review and reconcile on a regular basis. This should be done for mostly for mo this should be done monthly for most accounts, but pay for pay payroll it may be more frequent if your payroll is a biweekly or semi monthly. A monthly reconciliation in conjunction with a complete checklist will ensure your financials are accurate and making sure you have a handle on your activity. If there are any issues, you can address them timely. Next, we want to collaborate with the auditors. When the, audit, when the time comes for your audit to take place, it is best to collaborate with the audit team. I would advise you to establish open lines of communication and clarify expectations and objectives early in the audit. As time goes by, you should provide necessary access to information and personnel and pro proactively assess any questions or concerns raised by the, the auditors. Remember, at any time, if you need clarification, reach out with those questions or concerns. And lastly, we should learn from our audit findings. No one likes to make mistakes, but at the end of the day, we're all human. The best thing to do is if we have these errors or findings is to learn from them. Repeat findings can cause concern for the citizens, but sometimes the solution is out of your control or limited by budgetary constraints. If this is the case, try to improve the area addressed in the finding that is within your control, and then take the necessary steps to fully address at the next earliest opportunity. In the last financial statement audit of the auditor's office, I had a mistake that contributed to a finding in our accounts receivable. You can bet your bottom dollar, I will do everything it takes for that thing not, for that not to come up this next audit. Now that we went through some steps to help you prepare for an audit, I will go over some common audit findings. First, we have lack of segregation of duties. I mentioned this earlier in my presentation, but having the same person responsible and access to, to many processes can create an opportunity for fraud. An example of this would be the same person sends out the billing invoices, receives the payment from the invoice or from the client, deposits the check, and then also conducts the make bank reconciliation. This poses a significant risk as one person has access to everything to conduct fraud. I'm not saying if that person has unlimited access that they're going to conduct fraud, but there's a potential for mis misconduct if other life pressures were to occur. Next, you have improper bank reconciliations. They always say to follow the money. If you were able to complete your bank reconciliation on a regular basis, such as daily, weekly, or monthly, this would capture almost all of your organization's financial activity. By doing a bank reconciliation on a more frequent basis, this also reduces the risk of fraud and abuse by properly accounting for transactions in your accounting software. If this isn't done, how can you be sure your financials are accurate? Next, we have audit adjustments. When an audit adjustment takes place, Knowing the proper and de debits and credits can be confusing. I would recommend working with your auditor to ensure any adjustment is accounted for accurately. As Alex talked about earlier, budgets, an improper budget is a frequent finding. This is the item that will capture taxpayers' attention the most. If the budget is not compiled in conformance with state law, this will create many issues down the road. Understanding the budget process, providing the necessary communication with citizens and educating on them, educating them why you need that mill levy is crucial to successful budgeting process. The next one we have is capital asset maintenance. The first step to determine capital assets is to set a threshold for different asset categories. This can be varied for each political subdivision 
depending on size. Once the policy has been determined, properly accounting for additions, deletions, and depreciation is vital. Capital assets are generally very large purchases that can capture scrutiny from taxpayers. Balancing and accounting for them properly will hopefully alleviate any worry from the citizens. And finally, we have inadequate documentation. Back to my previous slide. If you don't have the documentation, the auditors cannot validate that the transaction was completed for the purpose stated. Hopefully reviewing some of these common audit findings will prompt you to look at your processes and to evaluate them before your next audit. If you can make a change that will eliminate a future finding, the audit will become more successful. With the last few minutes we have here today, I'm going to walk through a few financial records that uh, are usually requested in each area. First, we have cash. The auditors will generally request the bank statements, the bank reconciliations, any off-book accounts, and pledge or security documentation. An off-book account may be something you account for out of your accounting software, and it is imperative you provide that information to the auditors so that your cash is reported accurately. Next, we have receivables. We need detailed reports of accounts receivable, intergovernmental receivables, utility billings, taxes, and special assessments. Your accounts receivable should be listed by client and should include an aging to determine if there are any uncollectible accounts that your organization may have, and so they are reported accurately. We also have payables. We'll need detailed reports of your accounts payable, your loans payable, and your special assessments. I'm going through these quick, but I'm hoping you can refer back to these slides in the future and just provide some documentation of what you'll need to provide for the auditors. We've gone through a lot of this today, so that's why I'm not going into too much detail on what each one of these items is. But for capital assets, you'll need a list of your capital assets, your depreciation schedule, schedule your schedule of additions and disposals, any construction in progress, any big projects that were not finished by the fiscal year, and then any vehicle and equipment titles may be requested. Your long-term debt. You'll need a schedule of your debt, including your bonds, your loans, your capital leases, etc. Your amortization schedules, your list of new issuances, your bond and loan agreements, and since I thought it was really important, your amortization schedules. For payroll, we'll need your payroll registers, your tax filings, um, maybe your W-2s, and then also your HR policies. Uh, we'll also look at your vacation and sick balances as that creates a liability, and then any employee termination payouts. And finally, your revenue and expenditures, expenditures. This really comes down to your documentation. If you're recognizing the revenue or the expenditure, you need to have the proper documentation and support. The auditors will conduct testing on their revenue and expenditures to verify that they're reported properly. As we conclude here today, let's take a moment to appreciate the picture on the slide. Most of us would agree that this presents a nice relaxing image. Maybe it reminds you of your backyard. As you navigate the complexities of the audit, and strive for compliance with auditing standards. It is important to remember that you are not alone in this journey. By fostering a culture of collaboration, open communication, and continuous improvement, you can overcome challenges, mitigate risk, and achieve your goals. If we look at the steps I presented today, including starting early, knowing the standards, strengthening internal controls, ensuring you have the proper documentation, reviewing and reconciling on a regular basis, collaborating with auditors, and finally learning from your audit findings. These steps will allow us to go home at the end of the day and hopefully not stress about preparing for an audit. I appreciate your attention today, and if there are any questions, Callie, I'd be happy to take them now. Wonderful. Thank you, James. It looks like there aren't any new questions quite yet, but as those pop in throughout the day, we'll keep track of them for the Q&A panel this afternoon. And thank you for your time, James.